Chapter 29 These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. And Moses called unto all Israel, and said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh, and unto all his servants, and unto all his land, the great temptations which thine eyes have seen, the signs, and those great miracles. Yet the Lord hath not given you an heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear, unto this day. And I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. Ye have not eaten bread, neither have ye drunk wine or strong drink, that ye might know that I am the Lord your God. And when ye came unto this place, Sihon the king of Heshbon and Og the king of Bashan came out against us unto battle, and we smote them. And we took their land and gave it for an inheritance unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Keep therefore the words of this covenant, and do them, that ye may prosper in all that ye do. Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders, and your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and thy stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood unto the drawer of thy water, that thou shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God, as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. For ye know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which ye passed by, and ye have seen their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them. Lest there should be among you man, or woman, or family, or tribe, whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood, and it come to pass, when he heareth the words of this curse, that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. So that the generation to come of your children, that shall rise up after you, and the stranger that shall come from a far land, shall say, when they see the plagues of that land, and the sickness which the Lord hath laid upon it, and that the whole land thereof is brimstone, and salt, and burning, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath, even all the nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done thus unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? Then men shall say, Because they had forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods, and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not, and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger, and in wrath, and in great indignation, and cast them into another land, as it is this day. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Psalm 14 The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord? There were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. 
Oh, that the salvation of Israel will come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Good morning, and a happy Sabbath to you. We say in the words of the hymn, safely through another week, God has brought us on our way. And we trust that today, by the grace of God, as we worship and fellowship in the house of God, the church, we will all be refreshed and rejuvenated spiritually. Today we are focusing on one of our passages for today. We are reading Psalm 14 and verse 1. The Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Again, the fool had said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Today's message is entitled, God and the Fool. God and the Fool. Let us pray. Father, we pray now that you will help us to understand your word. For Christ's sake. Amen. In the poem, I Wonder, Jeannie Corby writes, I wonder why the grass is green. And why the wind is never seen? Who taught the birds to build a nest and told the trees to take a rest? Oh, when the moon is not quite round, where can the missing bit be found? Who lights the stars when they blow out and makes the lightning flash about? Who paints the rainbow in the sky and hangs the fluffy clouds so high? Why is it now, do you suppose, that dad won't tell me if he knows? End of quote. In works on systematic theology and evidences of Christianity, when evidences or arguments for the existence of God are presented, the evidences do not prove there is a God. Rather, they focus attention on the many indications we have around us and within us that God exists and is interested in us. A friend of mine, there are at least three general lines of arguments that embrace the evidences for the existence of God. We say that again. There are at least three general lines of argument that embrace the evidences for the existence of God. The first argument says that humans have an intuitive idea of God. The first argument says that humans have an intuitive idea of God. In other words, friend of mine, man everywhere believes in the existence of a God or gods to whom he is responsible and to whom he needs to be reconciled. Now, when we say that the idea of God is intuitive, we do not mean, we do not mean that it is an idea with which one is born, but rather we mean that the intuitive idea of God is an insight or perception that comes to men and women as a result of their observation of the things God has made. For example, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 22, Paul says, the Bible says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. In other words, Paul was acknowledging the fact that they, they, these people felt the need to worship something, worship something, and they built many idols. And then they said, just in case we miss one, they built an altar to the unknown God. And Paul says, you know what? This unknown being that you, 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 you sense is there and that you're trying to worship, I'm declaring him to you and explaining who he is to you. So the first argument for the existence of God says that humans have an intuitive idea of God. The second set of arguments for the existence of God are the arguments of reason. And there are a group of these arguments of reason. The other set of arguments for the existence of God are the arguments of reason. Now, these are philosophical evidences of God's existence. They are arguments that have been arrived at by the God-given and God-guided faculty of human reason. And so the first argument in this set, in this group, 
is the argument from cause, known as the cosmological argument, the argument from cause. Now, reason teaches us that every effect has a cause. Reason teaches that every effect has a cause. This universe, this world, intelligent men and women, they exist. They are the effects. We say again, the things around us, the universe, this earth, this world, trees, rivers, birds, intelligent men and women that exist around us, they are the effects. They are the effects. For them to exist, there must be a cause. There must be a cause. And so, this argument says that the original cause for these things being in existence must be a supreme intelligent being, God. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 26, speaking of the heavenly bodies, says, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their hosts by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. And then in this group is the argument from design, the argument from design or the teleological argument. The argument from design. The existence of design or plan reasonably presupposes a designer or a planner. We say that again. The evidence of design or plan reasonably presupposes a designer or planner. Man, nature, and the observable interactions between them indicate design. The designer is God. God demonstrated his, his designing ability in the construction of the earthly tabernacle. There was a plan. Hebrews 8 verse 5 says, Who serve unto the example and the shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith God, for see, saith God, that thou make all things according to the pattern shewed to thee on the mount. God gave him a pattern and said, and said to Moses, build the tabernacle according to this design. So the evidences of design around us in the things of nature says that there must be a supreme designer somewhere. The third argument within this cluster is the ontological argument, the argument from being, the argument from being. In other words, friend of mine, man, mankind has ideas of an infinite and perfect being, a being of goodness, truth, and holiness. Now, such ideas cannot find their source in imperfect beings like ourselves. We cannot just think up such lofty ideas from within us, from born in sin and shaped in iniquity creatures like ourselves. The very concept of infinite power, of truth and goodness, argues that there is an infinite and perfect being somewhere. These thoughts do not just spring out of nowhere. They come from some source. Then there is the moral argument, or what they call the anthropological argument. This argument says, the moral argument says, that man has a moral nature, a sense of right and wrong, of ought and ought not. And this sense of right and wrong is dull and often ignored, but it persists and implies a being to whom man is responsible and to whom he is accountable. This sense of right and wrong is indicated in this account in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 1 which says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. But when David did so, the Bible now records in 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 10, the Bible says, And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. In other words, something spoke to David's conscience. This sense of right and wrong, ought and ought not, suggests that there is a being out there who has implanted this, this consciousness of right and wrong in our hearts. Then there is the argument from congruity, from congruity, the argument from Congruity says that belief in a personal self-existent God is in harmony with all we know about our mental and moral nature and about the world. 
No other belief furnishes an adequate explanation of the things that we see around us. So belief in a personal self-existent God is in harmony with all we know about our mental and moral nature and about the world and no other belief furnishes an adequate explanation of these things. We must remember as we continue that these oversimplified arguments do not prove God's existence. They guide us in looking for evidences of his existence. And the third general line of argument that embraces the evidences for the existence of God is the testimony from the scriptures. The testimony from the scriptures. Remember we said that there are three, three general arguments for the existence of God. The first argument says that humans have an intuitive idea of God. The second argument is the argument of reason. And within this section, there are several arguments for the existence of God, the arguments of reason. And the third general argument for the existence of God embraces the testimony of the scriptures. The third general line of argument that embraces the evidences for the existence of God is the testimony of the scriptures. Now, we have already noted that the scriptures make no point of proving there is a God. However, in addition to their bold presentation of God as the originator of all things, the scriptures assert that intuitively and through creative things, there is in every man a consciousness of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 to 20 declares, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath shewed it unto them, Verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And so the scriptures recognize no atheism other than the practical atheism of stubborn people, of the stubborn will or depraved mind that refuses to acknowledge God. We say that again, the scriptures recognize no atheism other than the practical atheism of the stubborn will or depraved mind that refuses to acknowledge God. As in Psalm 14 and verse 1 which says, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And in Romans chapter 1 and verse 28 which declares, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. In other words, people see the evidences of God around them, but they refuse to keep God in their minds. They refuse to acknowledge God. And so, friend of mine, there is also the testimony of two phases of the message of the Bible itself, which appeals to us for the existence of God. There is also the testimony of two phases of the message of the Bible itself, which also leads people to believe in the existence of God. These have appealed to many skeptics as well as Christians. What are these two phases of the message of the Bible? One, the nature of the plan of salvation and the character of God. One, the nature of the plan of salvation and the character of God. And two, the accurate prediction of future events that indicates divine foreknowledge. Two, the accurate prediction of future events, as in Daniel 2, that indicates divine foreknowledge. These are added reasons why men and women should seek to learn more of the one who made all things and who has endowed men and women with a consciousness of his existence and power. O oh, friend of mine, I challenge you today that if you wish to become acquainted with Jesus, study and read the Holy Scriptures with reverence and prayerful humility. If you would become acquainted with the Savior, study the Holy Scriptures. The Bible says in John chapter 5 and verse 39 that the Scriptures testify of Jesus. And Job chapter 22 and verse 21 instructs us 
Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. O friend of mine, acquaint now yourself with Jesus and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto you. May God help us to appreciate the evidences around us that point us to a loving Heavenly Father who loves us and wants the best for us. Let us pray, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for reminding us that there is a God in heaven who cares for us. Help us to seek him and to serve him so that when the roll is called up yonder, we'll be there to answer present to our own names. Grant us, Lord, a happy Sabbath and a rich experience in your presence. For Christ's sake, amen and amen.